The family of a 65-year-old Quebec man in prison in Oman asking for the Canadian federal government for help. André Gauthier was arrested in Dubai three years ago on fraud charges, a crime that his family says not only he did not commit, but says that he was the whistleblower who brought the fraud forward. And he says that fraud was committed by the company he was working for. He brought that to the attention of authorities. André Gauthier is now in Oman. He tried to obtain a new passport from the consulate there three months ago after his was confiscated in Dubai. Dubai, but he was arrested again in Oman. Radha Sterling is a criminal and civil lawyer. She founded the organization Detained in Dubai. She's helping Gauthier and his family trying to get him home. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning. Uh, well, well summarized. I mean, essentially, this is a very common situation. And we've seen it with a number of Canadians and other Western nationals where they're actually scope gated. Uh, Sorry, uh, scapegoated. Uh, scapegoated, yeah, exactly, for um, other people's crimes. So in this case, it seems that someone else has committed a fraud, but to protect themselves, they bring frivolous charges against another person, usually an unsuspecting Westerner. What, let's let's circle back to you just the, in terms of the current situation. What do we know about how André Gauthier is doing right now? Oh, well, he's uh, obviously not doing well. He's already spent 18 months in detention arbitrarily in uh, Dubai. And now he's facing extradition to the same country that Western governments refuse, Western courts refuse to extradite people to based on unfair trials, discrimination, uh, torture and human rights abuses. So if he's returned to the UAE, he's facing potentially the rest of his life in prison, and especially as a 65 year old man. And have you been able to to speak with him directly? What kind of communication is there while he's detained in Oman? Uh, he's very limited with his access to the telephone. He's able to call his son usually uh, once a week, uh, but was unable to do so at his usual scheduled time on Sunday. Uh, so he has very limited communications via his lawyer. So imagine we're dealing with the family, and we're also trying to raise this situation to the Canadian government and to important people who are intervening diplomatically and hopefully negotiating with both the Omani government and also the UAE to drop these charges. Um, we're also appealing to Justin Trudeau today. Um, his son, Alexi, is making a, a direct appeal to him, and he's also appealed directly to the Sultan of Amman. The, the charges, I mean, you, you, you said that this is a pretty common situation, that you've seen this before, uh, that uh, Westerners end up being uh, charged uh, and for, scapegoated, as you put it, in situations like this. Can you get a bit of context? What do we know about these charges that he was faced with in, uh, that he is faced with in the UAE? How did this happen? Well, essentially, the, um, the person who allegedly committed the crime of embezzlement and fraud um, in, in sort of a Ponzi scheme uh, set up in Dubai uh, left the country, fled the country, and Andre remained behind to assist uh, other people involved in the company, company to investigate the person who had escaped. And charges were taken against him in Dubai. But it's a highly corrupt system there. And there are a lot of people involved, a lot of very important people, a lot of sheikhs from different nations. And it's one of those cases that has just stalled. They haven't officially charged him, and they have, but they, they kept him in detention for 18 months. It's a very common situation. We've dealt with about 10,000 cases over the past 10 years of injustice. And particularly investors, business people, and uh, expat workers who happen to be involved in the company can either be, like in this case, scapegoated, or in other cases, you might have a local partner who simply wants to try and steal or misappropriate investment or assets, and therefore they take false charges against someone. Evidence is not required to, to secure a conviction in the UAE. It can simply be someone's word that is sufficient to have someone detained and convicted. And so in this case, we're talking about a $30 million uh, fraud, and it has to do with uh, the company Gold uh, AE, uh, a gold uh, company that, that uh, Mr. Gauthier was involved with. He, so he was detained in the UAE. He was able, how was he able to leave to get to Oman? He, he entered Oman without any issues. The issues arise when he sought a replacement passport from the Canadian government. It flagged up because he was already on the UAE database, base, which is automatically shared with other GCC countries. Uh, without diplomatic intervention, it would also be an automatic extradition. But in this case, we, we have seen Oman previously deny an extradition request to the UAE and allow that national to return to, uh, as it were, France. 
and we're hoping that in this situation they can also see that he's definitely going to be subject to human rights violations in the event that he is uh, extradited to the UAE. I don't think that, you know, this case is going to be very good for the reputation of countries who are trying to attract foreign investment. They're trying to attract Canadian companies to go over to uh, Dubai Expo 2020 and promote mutual um, reciprocal investments. When we have a case like this that highlights the injustice of a legal system that's way underdeveloped, it's really in everyone's best interest to resolve it fairly and quickly and, uh, and, and to ensure that the reputation of both countries aren't damaged. So just, just to understand here, because he was charged in the UAE and detained, but then was able to travel to Oman, so they released him so that he could travel? And if so, why are they trying to get him back? It's, it's one of those situations where had he been able to uh, return to Canada, I don't think that they would have proactively sought him. And at, at this time, it just seems like an automatic procedure that he was you know, flagged up in Oman. And possibly the UAE would have preferred that he left the country, but the fact that he has been highlighted means that they want to kind of follow official procedures and perhaps get him back. And then with continued lobbying, they might consider dropping the case as well. But I think most cases are resolved through international media spotlights on injustice. Uh, when people have remained quiet about their plight and haven't spoken out freely about what's happened to them, they tend to end up spending potentially decades in prison. But as soon as the international spotlight is on that case, they're more likely to resolve it amicably. What is Canada's role now? What should the Canadian government be doing in this case? Uh, absolutely, the Canadian government needs to be um, entering into diplomatic um, communications, which, which so far they are, but they certainly need to um, stand up for their citizen and, uh, and really, really go in hard. They do need that pressure. They do need to promote good relations with Oman. Oman is, you know, a developing relationship with Canada, and it's certainly in their best interest to support that relationship. Again, they also need to nurture their relationship with UAE, which is, you know, um, the most, um, well, the strongest trade relation in the Gulf region. So there is a mutual understanding there that, you know, if, if a Canadian citizen is abused and um, convicted without evidence against him, uh, that's certainly not going to go well for diplomacy and it's not going to go well for a mutual investment. So you mentioned that you are uh, in communication with uh, Canadian officials. Uh, we, we did uh, hear through Agadzo Canada uh, from uh, Foreign Affairs Canada that uh, officials are uh, following this case uh, closely and that uh, consular services uh, have been uh, provided to the Canadian citizen and his uh, family uh, here in Canada and that they're actively working on this uh, dossier. What's the next step for you in terms of uh, pushing this case? Yeah, well, uh, the Canadian government has also entered into uh, diplomatic uh, communications with the United Nations in person in, in a meeting in New York last week. So we're waiting on the outcome from that. Another uh, avenue that we are going to be pursuing is the United, Africa United Nations application to Geneva for his uh, arbitrary detention for the last 18 months where there were no charges laid against him and certainly no evidence of wrongdoing. I think, you know, the public support has been amazing. We've had People just come out of the woodwork, contacting us, um, vouching for Andre that he's, you know, this wonderful guy that's known him for, you know, 20 years or he's been a previous client, all sorts of things. So the support is really growing. And I think that Canada really needs to step in and, and push this because it is a human rights violation and it's a consistent thing that is happening not only to Canadians but to Westerners in the Gulf region. Rada Sterling, thanks for your time this morning. My pleasure.